Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I'll begin with a story about the Crow Indians. It's a story about what happens when the economy of a society is destroyed and people's way of life literally comes to an end. It was told by their great chief, Plenty Coup, shortly before he died. He said, when the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground and they could not be lifted up again. After this, nothing happened. What did he mean by that? The, the culture that gave life meaning and purpose had died. The whole fabric of their belief system and standards was destroyed and that loss was literally irreparable. What could come next after that? Actually, the Crow Indian did survive despite this loss because their leadership reimagined their future, reimagined their role. It created a radical hope for the future. It was radical because it was a future that without guarantees, and most important, it was without despair. So it wasn't a messianic form of leadership. It wasn't a desperate form of leadership. It was a radical form built on hope. Um, and in a period of rational, rapid social and economic change, it raises key questions about how we draw on a community's memory and traditions to define the future. For example, the Labour Party is the product of industrial society, a party built on mass production over 100 years ago, a large stable workforce, large production units, mass consumption and a class society. Yet we are now in the middle of a deindustrializing revolution, fragmenting the communities we want sought to sustain. A post-industrial economy is taking shape around our advanced manufacturing and the new information and communication technologies. The shift to a service economy is flattening out old hierarchical command and control structures. Digital technology is unseating whole industries and workforces and production is becoming more networked and disorganized. Our class system is being reconstituted. The disruption of technological change is greater than at any time since the Industrial Revolution. So the institutions and solidarities workers created to defend themselves against their dispossession, against the power of capital, have disappeared or become outdated and ineffective. As such, social democracy has lost its social anchorage in the coalitions built up around the skilled working class. Once great ruling parties can appear hollowed out, in danger of shrinking into a professionalised political class. Moreover, often in government, they were not very social nor very democratic. Top-down, state-driven, compensating for the system, not reforming it. A politics about structures and not about individuals. Arguably, this model of social democracy was built in the industrial era, but has come to the end of its useful life. But these forces also challenge the Tories as well and their traditional conservative values. The dominant force over the last 30 years has been an ideology of neoclassical economics, arguably since the 1870s actually, or neoliberalism. Its market fundamentalism has driven growth and its destructive impact is now increasingly understood. A centralising and authoritarian state, an economy driven by individual greed, a culture of personal entitlement at the expense of a sense of obligation and duty to others, public goods commodified, communities fragmented, and our democracy weakened. And we're now living with the shakedown, with the consequences, the biggest bank bailout in our history, the slowest recovery, and the link between economic growth and rising living standards broken. Huge wealth for a few, whilst wages for the majority have been stagnant for years. Homes for ordinary families are not being built, and the skills training which business and young people need to succeed is inadequate. People's talent is wasted in dead-end jobs. There's not enough quality childcare to help women earn. The care system for the elderly is turning into a social catastrophe. Cumulatively, in 2015, George Osborne will leave the country with a deficit close to 70 billion and the national debt still rising. So here's one blindingly obvious paradox to start with. Despite the failure of the old order, we're also living in a time of tremendous opportunity. As the economy recovers, people want the opportunity to use their skills and talents to make a better life for themselves and their children. There's fantastic energy and willingness to create and to build and to turn Britain around. So, is there not two future stories taking shape in our country today? The first is the future of innovation and wealth creation. We are just at the start of the internet revolution. Radical innovations in the genera generation, processing and transmission of information will continue modernising the whole base of our economy. 
New services, products and markets will mean more knowledge, prosperity and opportunity. The web is breaking down barriers. Digital technologies have transformed startup costs and it's never been easier to start and run your own business. New creative cultures will generate economic wealth and deepen and enrich our experience of everyday life, expanding the sphere of human freedom and expression. Cities were at the centre of the first industrial revolution, with Manchester literally the first modern city. They will drive the new economic revolution across the world. In Britain, our cities will accelerate the forces of economic development with better infrastructure and digital connectivity and good skills and employment strategies. They will play to the creative strengths of the people. But without radical reform to our economy, this future will only belong to the few. There is a second future taking up shape in the shadow of this first one. A country scarred by dispossession. Its great industries gone, and with them, the skilled jobs and communities of the working class. People driven from secure full-time work into precarious, badly paid jobs. Poverty and inequality increasing, especially amongst the under 30s. Public services standardised, treating their users like supplicants, almost victims. Social mobility ground to a halt. The younger generation competing for fewer jobs and shut out of the housing market. One fifth of children leaving primary school without achieving a basic level of numeracy or literacy. 10 million people lacking basic digital skills. Are we not living in the best of times and the worst of times? For sure, the future direction we choose for our country will be decided by politics or the political sphere. But our system of government is failing people. Instead of sharing power, it hoards it. Those who make decisions on our behalf, whether they be in Westminster, Brussels, in business, the media, working in the public sector, are often too unaccountable. People feel powerless to contribute and make their voices heard. So, government has to change, and yet there will be more public spending cuts to come. So we literally cannot afford the status quo. In the new economy, politics will be about innovation and participation, about networks, not hierarchies. Parties will not win power in government, they'll have to create power, by building partnerships and wider public involvement. Instead of imposing change on communities, politicians will need to use their insights and experience of what works and what doesn't. We'll be conveners, actually, bringing people together to help them find solutions to the problems they face. Just as in the age of steam and the age of the railways, our new digital age is radically changing society. But while rail transformed society, it also created opportunities for the robber barons to monopolise and control it for their own good. We have to tackle concentrations of power and make sure people have the skills and the abilities to take advantage of the internet. In the vanguard of the new economy, there is a new productive force, which is the life of the mind. There are new kinds of raw materials the intangible assets of information, sounds, words, images, ideas, and they're produced in creative, emotional, and intellectual labor. To develop these opportunities, throughout the population, we need an education system that actually nurtures and cultivates the full range of human capabilities. Our present model of education rewards conformity in pursuit of a narrow, logical, and mathematical form of intelligence. It fails too many children and it reproduces the power of the already privileged. It is wasteful of our most important economic resource, which is actually our human ingenuity itself. We need to give craft and vocational work the same value and status as academic work and prioritise digital inclusion to help adults who lack digital skills make the most of the internet. Now, the uh, future represents a powerful challenge to my party. Uh, historically, our instincts have too often been to centralise, to uh, conform and to control. To shape the future of our country, we in Labour know that we have to do things very, very differently. Before we became the party of the state, we were a movement, developing leadership, organising people, creating power as a currency. Why so, therefore, why don't we confront the future through these traditions? The power to change our lives lives deep within each and every one of us. The political theorist, uh, Roberto Unger, makes this point. The institutions and structures we build make us who we are. But, as he says, they are finite and we are not. There is always more in us, more capability of insight 
of production, of emotion, of association than there is in them. We are, says Unger, context transcending spirits. Tonight's first political soundbite. I'm sure it will catch on. <laughs> now, the, the, the socialism for me is about this power within. This freedom to aspire and to find self-fulfillment is part of our modern consciousness. It is individual, but it is not selfish. It involves the right of everyone to achieve their own unique way of being human, to self-realize, self-actualize. To dispute this right in others is to fail to live within its own terms. And it is a mutual recognition that we're all dependent upon other people throughout our lives, not an atomized group of isolated, transacting individuals. We need one another to succeed individually. In our industrial society, solidarity called upon an underlying shared identity and a common economic interest. But it's no longer so effective in our diverse society of individuals. We need to create new models of interdependency. I would suggest reciprocity, which establishes a sense of justice in relationships. And a renewed idea of fraternity, which unlike solidarity, recognizes the diversity between equals. So for me, these define a politics that is both radical and conservative. A mix of new and blue labor, may I suggest. And the socialism of the future will be out creating power together for individual freedom. A future worth making. Now, Labour's policy review has been working on a program of national renewal in a time when there is no money to spare. Labour has been learning lessons from the past. For government over the last 30 years has often failed to meet the challenges of our time. The old mechanical model of public administration will not work in the future of complex problems. It has no, no solutions to the pressing problems of our time. Isolation, loneliness, family breakdown, the decline in trust, People are losing confidence in the ability of our public institutions to serve the collective interest. So we'll need to redefine the relationship between government and individuals, renewing our institutions step by step, learning as we go about what works, building dialogue and partnership. The role of government, therefore, will be to use its authority to create power for change, leverage capacity, generating momentum and negotiating between different interests to secure the common good of society. Designing policy will involve deliberation and co-creation with those who will be affected. Why shouldn't they design the systems? Giving people more control of their lives rather than pulling levers from Whitehall. So how about three standards for a prosperous democracy? The first standard being an inclusive economy. An inclusive economy that's pro-worker, pro-business, pro-aspiration. Labour will reform the institutions of our economy to deal with the causes of our economic problems and we will devolve power to our cities to unleash their economic potential. Any cursory look at comparative economic performance signals that cities are the key drivers in terms of modern growth strategy. We'll work our way, we'll grow our way to, out of austerity, boosting science and technology for innovation, boosting small and medium-sized businesses, boosting our infrastructure, increased trade, reshaping the relationship between finance and the productive economy to deliver more patient capital. People want decent jobs that are well paid. So we'll build dialogue between workers and employers to create partnerships for improving both business performance and pay and job quality. We'll tackle low pay and set up employer-led skills training and a national system of vocational education. Sharing power with people to give them more control over their lives includes over the work they do. Now the second element is about an inclusive society. We all know that emotional life is at the heart of the relationships that bind society together and family is the cornerstone, the bedrock. Government can help bring security and stability to society by investing in families. So Labour will invest to prevent social problems developing and so save money in the long term. We'll take a whole, person fam a whole family approach to policy that uses the power of relationships to strengthen the capacity of men, women and children for resilience, love, care. That includes valuing the role of fathers at home as much as mothers at work, and helping families balance their work and home commitments by extending free childcare. People need more control over their health and care, and so bringing health and social care together in a whole person approach is a major priority for the next Labour government. Instead of leaving older people helpless and dependent, we'll help families and communities to work with professionals to support them at home, and to help them manage their long-term health problems. 
relationships transforms people's lives, and so our policies will be designed to involve people as genuine partners in shaping their services around their individual needs. Of course, an inclusive society thrives with self-confident citizens, muscular citizens. So our education system needs to include character development across the curriculum, helping children to develop the emotional skills, self-esteem, and relationship to live more rewarding, flourishing lives. We'll benchmark our public policy on whether or not it adds social value, fosters reciprocity for a sense of fairness and justice, and increases individual and community resilience in the face of adversity and turbulence of the modern world. All roads lead back to questions of democracy and power. So the third standard is an inclusive politics. Politics is about empowering individuals and their families in the work they do and in the places they live. Yet we've got a trickle-down economy and a trickle-down government. So Labour will share more power and responsibility with people, increasing the power of local places by building collaboration amongst public services and organisations and pooling funds to stop efficiency, inefficiency and avoid duplication. This is happening in real time all across the country. Forced on by the scale of the retrenchment means that we have to innovate and create. We will also develop the government digital service to drive change across government, standardising data, improving sharing between departments and encouraging innovation. Our traditional pools of policy making, money and top-down government regulation stifles people's agency and initiative and are too often actually totally ineffective as well. Parties will need to build networks to connect with the greater array of small-scale innovations in society that are pioneering new directions in terms of policy. In the future, reform will need to engage more with people's behaviour and cultures and will mean mobilising people on the ground for change. So the internet is changing the nature of the public sphere. It could be used to rebalance power between citizens and the market and between citizens and the state. But we will address the problems of concentrations of power, child safety, privacy and data security. I tend to always think about this in terms of national renewal itself. Any cursory reading of history says that Labour only wins when it contests the national story effectively. 45, 64, 97. That's what we have to do again. This morning in Leeds, my colleague Andrew Adonis set out our Labour strategy for national economic renewal if we win in 2015. It will begin with the biggest devolution of power to our cities and county regions in 100 years, bringing government much closer to the people. It will establish regional banking, local powers over high streets, people-powered public services, and top-class system of vocational education and training tailored for local need. It will bring affordable homes to our sons and daughters, so if they choose, they can live in places they grew up. Labour councils like Leeds are already drawing up, together with local, public, private, and third sector, data to literally redesign their cities based on open data flows. And we'll foster the creativity that has seen Tech City grow in London, and we'll repeat it in other English cities. 20 years ago this month, Tony Blair took hold of my party. He spoke back then of building a new era in an old country. We face the face same challenges today in tougher times. Now, Ed Miliband will deliver on this vision in the new digital age. Our policy review is the engine for these ideas, for new thinking and facing the challenges of the future. Think in terms of my party's history. Labour built its history organising working people to defend the integrity of their family lives, to struggle for fair wages and a decent home, and to create a better future for their children. And aspirational politics about bread and butter issues. That makes still remain the fundamentals for a decent life. But this, to this tradition, we must make a prophetic story of human possibility for the new times within which we inhabit. Self-evidently, we do not live in the future. We live now in the only life we will ever know. Our prophetic story is about how together we can create a world in which each of us can live life to the full. How each of us can live a good life. To achieve it in the time we have, our highest good. We'll call it radical hope.